Good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight, we are delighted to have Suzanne Bennett and Mark Decay uh, giving a real lecture as part of the Durability and Architecture series. Um, they're both visiting Deakin at the moment, working with some faculties uh, about the, on the integral theory. Um, so Mark is a professor of architecture at the University of Tennessee, specialising in sustainable design theory and tools. Uh, he's author of Integral Sustainable Design, Transformative Perspectives, and primary co-author of Sun, Wind and Light Architectural Design Strategies. Suzanne uh, was educated as an archaeological anthropologist at Columbia. Suzanne is a master public speaker with more than 35 years experience in the fields of personal growth, building science and environmental issues. Uh, she is editor of Sun, Wind and Light Architectural Design Strategies and of Integral Sustainable Design Transformative Perspectives. Uh, the lecture this evening is titled Solving the Climate Crisis by Design. Uh, please welcome Mark and Suzanne. Thanks. Thanks so much for having us. When we first were invited to do the real lecture, we figured it was an acronym, you know, and we, we didn't know what it stood for. So I... Uh, I wrote to Ned and I said, uh, you know, what does real mean? <laughs> and Ned said, you know, like real. <laughs> we not, said, oh, not fake. right, not fake. And we went, oh, okay, we're, we're into that. So thank you so much for inviting us. We're always, always, always up for and enthusiastic about sharing our passion and our perspective about climate change. Um, and so we feel that this is really urgent in our, especially in architecture today. So our topic today, as you can see, is solving the climate crisis by design. It might sound like a slightly audacious assertion or vision or topic, um, but we hope that you align with us and, and join the team for solving it by design. So... For the students here, we want to say that uh, you are inhabiting really a most exciting time in history. And you're going to be the first generation that will figure out whether or not we're going to succeed in something that we as a species collectively have never done before, and that's to keep the climate from warming by two degrees. And, and actually, it's mainly because of this extraordinary challenge that we are asserting that you're also at the most exciting time of architectural history because normally the larger the challenge, the, the more opportunity there is to make a difference. As you may know, one of the finest minds uh, of our times died recently. Uh, and, and Stephen Hawking said this as one of his last communications to the world, that climate change is one of the great dangers that we face at this time, and that it's one that we can prevent if we act now. And, you know, we've been dealing with global warming since, I don't know, the 70s, before the 70s. Who remembers when we first started dealing with that? Um, and what... Stephen Hawking said is we are close to the tipping point where global warming becomes irreversible. So in about 2003, this was on the cover of Metropolis magazine. It's a design magazine that comes out of New York City. And it really had an impact on architects in the, state. It in the States. It began to wake us up to the fact that buildings use about half of the energy that we use. And they're they're run almost entirely on fossil fuels. And so they're also responsible for approximately equal amount of greenhouse gases and the resulting climate change. And as you can see, building energy use in the United States is about equal to industry and transportation combined. So buildings really are the big elephant in the room, and that is starting to attract a lot more attention. So we stand at really the end of the fossil fuel age, the dawn of the solar age, and we've had years of design and planning education that's been influenced by the Beaux-Arts, by the Bauhaus, and more recently by postmodernism. 
but really none of those approaches have had really any great ideas about solving the climate crisis. We haven't addressed that through those dominant approaches. So we can keep building with these fossil fuel era ideas and fail at the challenge to solve climate change, or we can rethink the design of buildings and cities for the solar age. So Mark and I have been thinking about climate change for some years now from uh, four different perspectives, and we're going to take these tonight one at a time. So this is how most people, we call this the technological sustainability aspect of climate change. This is how most people think of climate change. It's a, it's a problem of resources and pollution, which is only partially true. It's true, but it's only partially true. So we, we obviously you know, can't have resources forever and ever. We have to manage them intelligently or, you know, we'll wind up in collapse, like some of the cultures that I studied as an anthropologist. So the other half of this technological problem is pollution. And we used to think, when I was in school, that we were going to run out of resources, and that re resource conservation was the dominant thing that we had to work on. But more recently, we figured out that actually, way before we want to run out of resources, that the sinks, the, the atmosphere, the oceans, the places that we're putting all of the things that we produce in our industrial world, that's actually the more dominant problem. So we can't absorb everything that's being put out there, and the system becomes overburdened. So this is a shot, I think, from one of the satellites, right? Uh, this one's actually from, uh, you know, an orbiting spacecraft. Okay, orbiting spacecraft. And this is the Earth's atmosphere at uh, sunrise. And if you look at it, it really shows you the fragility of that of the planet's skin of our atmosphere. And you can see where the atmosphere is. It's a, that's where life exists. So regarding this thin film, here's the scenario. The energy that's trapped by man-made global warming pollution is now equivalent to exploding 400,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs per day. 365 days a year. It's a big planet, but that's a lot of energy. Especially if we multiply 400,000 times every day. That's that works out to four atomic bombs per second. Yeah. So. This is what man-made global warming looks like on the ground in everyday terms. This is actually a, a coal-burning plant near our home in Tennessee. So what we think of as electric lights are really coal-burning lights. 16 of the 17 hottest years on record have occurred since 2001. And the hottest year ever measured, 2016, we're still waiting for the final data to come in on 2017, but we expect it to be in this same group. 16 out of 17 ever recorded. So I want to show you something here. And so here's a zero. And we're going to go back 800,000 years this way. right? And then the vertical axis, we're first going to have um, temperature. And we're also going to look at carbon. right? And I want you to look at where 300 is on the vertical scale when we begin to see that. And you'll, so, so up until recently, we never went above 300 parts per million of CO2. So here we have CO2 going back 800,000 years. And you can see every 150,000 years or so, there's a big, giant cycle. And there's temperature tracking right along with it. There's your 400 parts per million that we reached in 2013. And here's where we're headed. So we're on a track there to be up at uh, 600 parts per million. So one of these little blips down here right? that's small, that's an ice age right? in historic terms. And when you hear people say, oh, you know, the planet is always going up and down, you know, look at the past. Yeah, it's going up and down. The Earth has but cycles. it's not doing that. <laughs> so just like uh, in our rather recent past, these warmer temperatures are melting the glaciers and they're causing the seas to rise. This is a U.S. Geological Survey photograph. What they've done is set up uh, time uh, cameras 
to track what's happening with the glaciers. And so this is the glacier in 1926. This is the glacier in 2008, and it's even smaller now. So the glaciers in Glacier National Park have reduced from 150 to 25, less than 25. So like Prince, we're probably going to have to rename our national park and call it the park formerly known as Glacier. <laughs> in uh, about 2007, the Northwest Passage uh, became open to ships uh, for the first time without the need of an icebreaker. And recently, a Canadian icebreaker made it all the way to the North Pole. It was the first time a ship had ever been to is. the North Pole. Yeah. And of course, this disappearing ice is causing lots of problems for the endangered polar bears. And Miami, uh, you might have heard of that. Regular flooding, three centimeters a year. Is this is Miami. They call this sunny day flooding. There's no way. So now for some good news yeah. from the technological perspective on sustainability. So we have sun and wind more than enough to meet all the needs of humanity on the planet. We already have all the knowledge and we already have all the technology to solve the climate crisis. So in general, when we take this viewpoint, this perspective on the problem of the climate, from the technological sustainable approach, we're looking at making our machines and our buildings more efficient. We're looking at running them um, on renewable energy, reduce, reuse, recycle. So basically, the mantra is no fossil fuels, no problem. Right. And that's, we're going to argue, partially essential, true. partially true, but not sufficient. Now, Vatican City has pledged to be the first carbon neutral country, and they do have God on their side, <laughs> but the Costa Ricans beat them in 2015 by becoming uh, the first 100% renewable energy country. And Uruguay is up to 95% clean energy, and also Bonaire, a little, it's a little island uh, in the Dutch Caribbean, they run on 100% renewables using a combination of wind power and backup biodiesel uh, generators, which use fuel made from algae grown in their salt flats. I just love that. So we have renewable energy countries on the horizon and already happening. And entire cities are also converting to 100% renewable energy. There are five cities in the U.S. and Brazil alone has 15 fossil-free, fuel-free cities. And these cities are cleaning up their air quality. They're increasing their bottom line. Simultaneously, they get to feel really great about energy independence. Now, like much of the world, the U.S. is moving away from coal as a primary source for energy production. So here are all the new plants that have been proposed and defeated in the U.S. since 2005. And here's all the existing plants that have already been retired and uh, some with the end dates that have been announced. So even though it's not yet sunk in for our president, coal is essentially dead in the United States as a U.S. As, as, as a source of electricity production. So the U.S. has really been moving very powerfully away from fossil fuel and toward renewables in spite of the regressive thinking in Washington. Uh, states, regions, and cities are still going forward. So this is all the energy expansion that happened last year. Two-thirds were solar and wind. Two-thirds and almost nothing from coal, 0.01%. So what are designers, what's design got to do with it? What are designers and builders doing? So the technological approach to solving this problem focus on, focuses on making more efficient use of resources and reducing greenhouse gases and the impacts that buildings have on that. 
And that doesn't have to look like a technological machine. So one of my uh, favorite architects here, Hassan Fadi from Egypt, uh, who's a really interesting architect that really adopted uh, or adapted, you might say, modern building science thinking and combined that with a traditional form language. So here you see a kind of market building um, in, a, in a new town that, uh, that he designed and built. And so you have this traditional language uh, uh, that we call uh, high thought, low tech. Uh, and in this project, he's actually using uh, wind catchers. Uh, so you can see the wind coming in, evaporative cooling in the process of that downdraft tower, earth contact cooling at the bottom, updraft uh, stack ventilation on the other side. Uh, and, and so it's, it's amazing, right? So these are traditional technologies, but then he's using calculations and science to actually tune those things. And this is for Egypt's poor. This is what he's building for Egypt's poor. And this is a project by HOK, which is one of the biggest architecture firms in the world. And while it uses this low-tech wall made out of hay bales, straw bales, they use building science and high thought throughout. They make an envelope that performs for thermal, lighting, and moisture issues. And as a former building envelope specialist, I'm particularly taken with the uptake and use in the United States of this material, hempcrete. It's a building scientist's dream, as far as I'm concerned. It's industrial hemp and lime. And it's been used, actually, all over the world for thousands of years. It's a really low-tech way of building. It's made from easily renewable, easily grown plants on horrible soil and lime. Uh, it's both the interior, the exterior, and the, um, the insulation of the wall and it sequesters carbon. Now, technological sustainability also applies rational thought to classical problems, such as the way that fixed shading elements can be proportioned relative to the geometry and the path of the sun. So you have here uh, Corbu's famous mill owner's building in Ahmedabad. And uh, on the bottom left here, you can see the kind of plan view of the western facade. So you're looking at a big brie soleil cut in plan. And so in addition to keeping all of the sun off of the west facing facade in front of a glass wall, right, if you notice the angles of these fins there, they're perfectly aligned to accept the incoming cooling breezes. So on the left side here, you have the west facade uh, with the combination of horizontal and vertical elements. And on the right-hand side, this is the east-facing facade. So it's a cooler time of the day. It also faces out onto a river. So you know, it wants it to be a little bit more open. So luckily, there's a very strong marriage between Mother Nature and technology. So what we want to kind of demonstrate here is that there's way more energy available on building surfaces than buildings actually need. So these two little red bars over here on the right-hand side, that's how much energy U.S. buildings use. So residential is a little smaller. Industrial is a little bigger. That's, that's on a per square unit floor area basis. And remember that U.S. buildings are really some of the most consumptive in the world. So what you have over here on the left side of this chart is bars that represent how much solar energy arrives on the roof and on the facade. So uh, we've asked all kinds of engineers and physicists, uh, do you think you could solve the energy problem for buildings, looking at this graph, right? So we have, even in very cloudy northerly Seattle, Washington, more than four times the energy necessary. And the latest expression of technological performance is net zero energy buildings, even whole neighborhoods that produce as much renewable energy on site as they consume. So here's a design for a net zero energy neighborhood in Colorado by Michael Tabel and David Kahn. And you can see the kind of checkerboard plan, which is designed to get the winter sun into the south and then sun to every roof on PVs. So if you're going to make a net zero energy project or even better, maybe a plus energy project, 
you first got to radically reduce the energy loads and the demands that the building is making. And so in this project, um, about a third of that reduction uh, comes from good, basic, passive solar design, basic form, orientation, organization, placement of the windows, and so forth. About a third comes from the technology of the tightly well-built envelope. And about another third of the reductions comes from the mechanical systems that are highly efficient and also use heat recovery ventilation. And so now let's just do a quick review. We've gone over technological sustainability and ecological sustainability. No, we're going Oh, there. no, we're going on it's ecological sustainability. So these are two different kinds of sustainability. And the next one that we're going to look at is ecological. So the land-based animal and plant species are now moving poleward. They're moving because of climate change at a rate of about 15 feet per day, which is for evolutionary migration of a species incredibly rapid. So let's take a picture, uh, a look at what that looks like. This year. Mm. So this is a simulation. It's based on the current needs of 2,900 species of mammals, amphibians, and birds, which shows the paths of their migrations as a result of climate change. They're moving to higher elevations and to higher latitudes at rates that are approximately two to three times faster than previously reported. Now, a warming atmosphere is also creating more extreme weather. Some areas will have more intense floods. Other areas have more intense droughts. This is a dry lake bed in Lebanon. And it's just one symptom of a drought that's going on in the Middle East right now. And it is the worst drought in 900 years. So when we have this in, in intense heat, uh, meeting this lack of water, the crops fail, and the people end up migrating to the cities. Drought, food scarcity, and political unrest all connected. They're related. And they are already, as you know, causing huge losses of life and homeland for millions of people. This graph shows an increase of over 300% uh, worldwide in weather catastrophes. This is over a 35-year period. And we can see that the uh, frequency of extreme temperatures, of droughts, and of fires are all increasing. The frequency of major floods and intense storms is also increasing. And the high water temperatures, like temperature in the ocean is going up, and it's creating these giant growing phytoplankton colonies on the west coast of North America, all the way from Alaska to California. And in America, they call it the blob. And this shows the last 10 years of the blob growth in Monterey. And for the first time, uh, two years ago, it stuck around during the entire summer. It turned toxic. It impacted the fishing industry significantly and killed off 15 whales. So as temperatures are going up, wildfires around the world are also increasing in the dry regions. This is a picture of Africa from one of NASA's satellites. It's fairly recent. And it's showing you know, a huge number of fires that are going on. Some of those are human caused. Some of them are from slash and burn practices. But most of them are not. And of course, this is a photograph I took yesterday at breakfast from a newspaper that was on the table. So Australia is well aware of the frequency and intensity of bushfires. So when we think about that technological perspective, we're measuring and we're weighing, we're counting energy units, we're counting carbon units and so forth. But from the ecological perspective, we're looking at social systems and we're looking at ecological systems and we're seeing all of these kinds of cascading impacts. So remember that you know, when we're burning fossil fuels, particularly when we're burning coal, that's driving global warming, but it's also producing particulates in, into the air. This is Beijing. And just two weeks after this picture was shot, we saw this, which has some of the worst air pollution ever. And this is essentially from 
coal burning power plants. And you know, a lot of people talk about uh, how this level of air pollution has increased, uh, decreased the tourism to China. You know, people don't want to go there anymore. But the worst result is that it impacts human health, particularly for children and the elderly. This kind of fossil fuel induced pollution is actually decreasing life expectancy in many Chinese cities. Due to climate change, tropical diseases are also on the move to completely new habitats. And this is how they're spreading. So we have West Nile virus, Rift Valley fever, dengue fever, Zika virus. They're all moving faster than ever before as a result of climate change. And the human cost and the suffering for all of this is enormous. And as you may know, warmer air actually holds more water. And as the temperatures go up, on average, the air holds 4% more water in the atmosphere. That means more water to make storms, more rain, and floods are bigger. This is my, in my home state of Louisiana, uh, where 50 centimeters of rain came down in two days. So there's also some solutions from the ecological sustainability perspective. In this realm, we're looking at how, not just about saving energy, but uh, how energy production and consumption uh, can be looked at as a network. How our social systems can function like ecosystems. And the ecosystem, if you think about it, is a solution that's evolved uh, with natural intelligence uh, and it's 400 billion years in the making. So we might have something we can learn from that. Now, in the U.S., uh, buildings, as we said, take up about uh, half of all energy use. And so they're responsible for an approximately equal share of global warming gases. Uh, and this is a, a slide from a fellow named Ed Masria in an organization called Architecture 2030. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But basically what he's suggesting for us is that about 80% of our problems, 70 to 80%, can be solved by embodying more knowledge into our designs. That essentially, intelligent design uh, of cities and buildings are a huge part of reducing the energy loads and therefore the cascading impacts on the climate. And unless you do that, you can never have really a renewable energy system that's big enough uh, or effective enough in terms of cost. So design is this huge, great opportunity to solve the climate crisis. And in this more systems-oriented approach to solving the climate crisis, this, the solution is more than a technological solution. And we believe that how we get to carbon-neutral architecture is by a design process that gets the right things first. So this diagram is from Sun, Wind, and Light. And basically, the proposition is, is that, you know, you start off with the simple solutions. You start off with architectural solutions at the level of, of archetypes. Um, and then you move up through various kinds of stages, right? But the last thing you want to do is design something like a PV system, right? And so if you think about that Ed Masria idea of 80% of the work is done in those lower sections and only the 20% at the top. And, and obviously, if you turn this pyramid upside down, it's very unstable. You can't really make it work that way. So we're now also able to create zero energy buildings that produce, as we talked about before, as much energy on site in a year as they consume. And while net zero is a performance measure, and you would think I'm talking about something technological, the process that gets us there is actually much more holistic. It's more complex and more nonlinear than in the past. As we saw before, we have whole complexes and entire neighborhoods that are net zero. So from the perspective of ecological sustainability, everything, including buildings, is part of a larger context that's in a system. If we just measure kilowatt hours per, per square meter per year and get an energy use intensity, it says nothing about the pattern. It says nothing about the neighborhood, right? It says nothing about the ecological context. They're both true, but they're, act, they're completely different ways of thought. 
And Mark has been working on organizing the knowledge base of designing with energy for about 25 years. And this is the cover of the third edition of Sun, Wind, and Light. And it uses a perspective of ecological sustainability to organize 150 design strategies that help with net zero buildings and neighborhoods. So this is just a, uh, a visualization of a kind of way of thinking about problems from a si uh, systems point of view. So in the diagrams, I'm going to show you in just a second when the little video starts, uh, each of the icons represents one design strategy. And, and we call these our design strategy maps. And so these are, are, are combined into nine levels of hierarchical relationships, uh, starting with neighborhoods and going down all the way to materials. Each of the lines in the diagrams here uh, represents the relationships among the strategies. And so it forms a kind of overall idea of a kind of knowledge ecology. And what we recognized when we were mapping this with our students um, was that there seemed to be families of related strategies that could be used to solve recurring kinds of problems in design. Well, there we go. And so we call these uh, strategy bundles. And what's important there is really the kind of pattern of relationships amongst the individual strategies. And so that's our kind of perspective that only shows up when you're looking at something from a systems or an ecological point of view. Now, ecological sustainability usually begins with the notion, and all these things are familiar, right? They're not necessarily foreign to architectural or design thought. But it begins with the notion that the landscape and the climate are fundamental contexts for design. So, and again, the idea of context doesn't occur. It's not on the horizon from the methodologies that are available in the technological viewpoint. So these two images uh, both show river valleys. The one on the left is from the Rio Grande near Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's hot, it's dry, and there's only this thin little ribbon of green life that happens right next to the water. On the right-hand side is the Columbia River Gorge between the states of Oregon and Washington and the Pacific Northwest of the United States. And so it's lush, it's green, Everything grows there. There's tons of water, tons of fish. Um, so you can imagine that, you know, the way that one might design buildings and landscapes and cities in both of these places might be completely different. And as an example of that, um, we have a forward that, please. Uh, <laughs> this is in Charleston, South Carolina. It's a warm humid summer climate almost all the time, even in the winter. Uh, and so on the left is what's called the Charleston single house type. It's only one room deep, and it has double porches on the south side and a garden to the south of that. So the south gardens ensure that winter sun reaches the buildings and the porches shade the building in the summer. And Charleston is a peninsula. Uh, between two rivers, and so the winds blow from the southwest across its narrow dimension. The streets and the gardens are aligned to this breeze. So we have the city plan, we have the site planning of the blocks and the streets, and the site plan of the individual lots, and the house design, and they're all coming together to maximize uh, summer ventilation and also winter access to the sun. So this idea of working with multiple scales is a kind of a defining characteristic of this way of thinking, where we're always trying to look at what's the constituency of the wholeness that we're looking at creating. But buildings that run on the distributed natural resources of renewable energy require thermal storage that can be thermally sailed, as it were, much like tuning the sails of a ship. This adds the element of time to performance, and our ecological sustainability approach becomes one of processes. So those can be pretty simple and direct, but it's very different than, let's say, the engineering logic of trying to make a building as efficient as possible and then put an efficient machine inside. So this is uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's famous solar hemicycle house, and so it's a passive solar architecture. And they take excess daytime solar energy that comes through this uh, curving south facade, 
the solar energy comes in, it's absorbed by massive uh, concrete floors, and the entire back wall is made out of stone. Uh, so you can see this is the sort of sunny uh, southern side. This is the more protected, burned up north side to protect against those cold winds, and it has very small openings and, and so on. Um, so this is really the, one of the first uh, manifestations of trying to think through the notion of a time-based cyclical approach where architecture is responding to nature. And so this process-based thermal sailing also applies on the cooling side. This is unair conditioned, passively cooled building, an office building that's fairly well known in England by a, a group called Field and Clegg, some, some really cool architects. And so they're using night cool mass, for one thing. Uh, also, uh, natural ventilation and cross ventilation and stack ventilation, as you can see through those uh, uh, towers there. Um, and so night cool mass, as you might know, is a kind of cyclic maneuver where when it's too hot outside, you close the building. The internal heat gains are building up. They go into the thermal mass at night when the air, air temperature cools down. Then you open up the building again. You bring in massive amounts of cool air. It cools down the mass, and the cycle starts all over again. So interacting with buildings in thermal rhythms is one of the ways that buildings can connect us to nature and because we become more of an active participant in the ecosystem. I love that idea of the participation in it. <laughs> this is a well-known project by uh, architect, landscape architect John Lyle, one of the uh, fathers of the idea of regenerative design. This is his Center for Regenerative Studies in California. It's a kind of live-in educational model. It's a research complex that where they take the form and organization of the building and the landscape both, and they're shaped around the flows of energy, information, water, materials, food, and so forth. They're growing their own food, processing their own waste on site biologically. Students are living in the building. The classrooms are in the building. The laboratories are in the building, um, and so on. And it's heated with the sun and, and, and cooled naturally. And so it's very much like a, a, a settlement that arises out of thinking and operating as much as possible in ecosystematic terms. The third perspective that we want to share with you is that the climate change is also a crisis of meaning. It's a, a crisis that's emanating from our myths and our stories that we tell ourselves about what nature is, about what we should do in relationship to nature, about what our place in the universe is, essentially about our worldviews. And every one of these worldviews has its light side, its positive side, and its dark side. And it's perhaps so that most of our societies have let that dark side rule for a bit too long. Yeah, and this is what the dark side looks like near where we live in Tennessee. It's a coal mine and they use what's called mountaintop removal. Essentially, they strip off the entire living layer, they scrape it away, and they excavate the coal down hundreds of feet. And it not only obliterates every life form on the surface, but it has devastating effects on stream pollution downstream and human health. These mining areas have the lowest life expectancy in the entire United States. So this is the kind of dark side of modernism and modern industrial thinking where life doesn't have any value in the economic equation. Now this is one of Mies van der Rohe's famous houses, the Farnsworth House, right? And I call this the dark side in disguise. <laughs> because it wants us to believe, right? It wants us to be connected to nature. It wants to remove the boundary between inside and outside. What this kind of well-intentioned architecture, this glass box approach, is also sustained only by huge inputs of energy that can be traced right back to that kind of mountaintop removal, coal mining in Appalachia. So in the modern uh, level of thought, architects do pollute. Uh, this is a before and after view of the Canadian tar sands. So to quench our thirst for oil, the life of really great natural landscapes like this are being sacrificed. This is what we mean by a crisis of meaning. This is the kind of story that we have to rewrite. And 
This is why the largest gathering of First Nations in history has been happened recently to block these pipelines from the tar sands into the U.S. and across Native lands. As the, the writer Thomas Berry has said, we need a new story of the earth. So now for some solutions in this domain of cultural sustainability. Basically, it's about creating new cultural stories and expressing the values of more developed worldviews. So luckily, this is actually happening all over. Meet the Wanganui. Does anyone know about the Wanganui? This is a, it, you might, it might look like a river, but in the eyes of the law, it has the standings of a person. New Zealand recently granted their third largest river legal personhood, which will give it rights and interests under the law. In 2008, the country of Ecuador granted rights to nature built into their constitution, which says nature has the right to exist, to persist, to maintain itself, and to regenerate its vital cycles. So maybe we solve the climate crisis for our own personal reasons. But maybe we also do it because we adopt an expanded circle of care and concern. And here's another great example from Professor Ed Ng from the Chinese University in Hong Kong. That's so NG, however you say yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone know how to say that? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Did I get it? Close. Close. No. <laughs> <laughs> so this is really an amazing story. In 2007, an earthquake leveled hundreds of villages in China, and they were way up in the mountains. So Ed took a team of his students on a three-day journey to reach the village. And when he got there, he saw this old woman, and she was under a tarp. And uh, he said, you know, I promise you're going to have a new house. And she goes, oh, no, just let me die here. You know, she completely resigned to, you know, no future. And he goes, no, I'm promising you a house before the Chinese New Year. Of course, the students were like, yeah, how are we going to do this? Yeah. How yeah. Do you do that? <laughs> but they returned to Hong Kong and they designed a new construction system. Uh, they use rammed earth with bamboo reinforced, earthquake resistant, utilizing the rubble from the destroyed buildings and local on site materials. And they went back and tested it in their lab. Ed has an amazing lab there. And, you know, that was great, but they returned in three months, and what had happened, oh. yeah, oh, I don't want to tell them that yet. No, not yet. All right. They built the prototype, they returned and built it with passive solar heat and natural ventilation, and they taught the villagers how to do the construction. And in a few, they were only there for a couple of months. So the old woman and her husband did have a new home, and then they returned to Hong Kong. But when they came back three months later, they returned to find three months that the villagers had rebuilt the entire village themselves. And the government had subsidized every family with $700 to do this, but the construction was so inexpensive that they actually made a profit. <laughs> so it's really kind of, we, we love the story. It's an interesting, great example of the cultural perspective on sustainability because it so clearly illustrates how a community can come together and how designers can come together um, and align behind an important idea. And it's that when we say cultural, we're talking about that conversation and that dialogue that brings people into agreement. And it's, it's really been noted more than once that the problem is not that we don't know what to do technologically. The problem is that we can't get our act together culturally to make the right kinds of actions and decisions. So here's another example. I mentioned Architecture 2030 earlier. Uh, and this is an organization uh, who's made a challenge to architects and engineers in, the, in North America. So this is, uh, this is active in the United States and in Canada. And so what they, uh, it's really sweeping the profession too. What they ask people to do is to take whatever amount of energy is available or not available, but the, for the standard building, right? So you have a benchmark building, you know how much energy that uses uh, in your climate for your building type. 
and to say, well, today, and they started a few years ago, but today we're at the 70% target. So let's reduce the fossil fuel use in the building by 70%. And then incrementally, working up to 2030, we're going to continue to reduce that amount of fossil fuel energy until by 2030, we're at what they call carbon neutral, which means no fossil fuel being used to operate the building. And this applies to new construction and to major renovations. And the good news is that more than half of the large firms, the biggest firms in the United States, have signed on to these targets. And although this seems to be a set of technical car, uh, targets, it's also an example of cultural agreement about what to do to solve the climate crisis. And this is where architecture is headed. It's the frontier of this time. It re represents a momentous opportunity for the design professions. And, and all the government technocrats can't believe it, right? Because every time they make their technological predictions and, and crunch their numbers, they're saying, oh, we have this exponential curve going up. We've got more population. We're building more buildings. We're going to use more energy. So we're going to need more energy. And our energy demand is going to be like this. And our carbon problems are going to keep doing this too. And so every two years, they make one of these plans. And they have to, it started like this, and then it was this, and then it was this. Because every time, the actual industry, the built environment industry, was taking that energy and carbon use. And they're still building more buildings. They still have more square footage. But the, the total energy use is now on the downswing. So yeah, architects cool. and engineers, planners, and so forth have completely reversed in North America that curve on, in the built environment. So this is the first uh, lead. Uh, lead is our kind of generic uh, uh, environmental evaluation system uh, for buildings in the United States. This was the first lead platinum building in the US. And so in, in addition to the many kind of energy and water and material strategies um, that you can imagine, it's using uh, you know, PVs on the facade and collecting water, rainwater, and so forth. Um, but that's not why we're showing this, really. It's, it's really because it becomes clear in a building like this that it's, it has a message to communicate. It's trying to say something about sustainable design. Maybe it's a little bit in your face, but it really has a message. And it's not just about performance. It's about teaching people um, that come there about an idea of nature and how we might design in relationship to that idea of nature. So it's that communication that doesn't always by itself just kind of somehow magically bubble up from a technological solution. It takes somebody thinking carefully about how to put that together. This is uh, the architect Lawrence Scarpa's house uh, in California. It's also known as the solar umbrella house. And you can see these kind of PVs that are up on the roof, flat horizontally, and then they kind of wrap around down onto the south facade. But again, it's not an energy machine, per se. It's also a place to experience the climate and the outdoors. And it's expressing an idea about a way of living, about a connected way of living with nature. So it merges rich experiences with high performance. And it's that merging of experience and meaning and performance in sustainable design that we believe is the key to solving the climate crisis by design. All right, well, someone may recognize this photograph. In addition to our crises of resources and pollution, ecosystems and meaning, as if those were not enough, we also have a crisis of consciousness. Again, we, we, most people think of the climate crisis as a, pro a technical problem, but unbelievably, many people still don't think it's a problem at all. Here's one of those people. Our U.S. <laughs> president thinks that climate change is a hoax created by the Chinese to give them competitive advantage over U.S. manufacturing. So it's a kind of pre-rational thought in this kind of ethnocentric morality. And we really need some higher level consciousness if we're going to solve the problem. So when we look at the world through one of these particular lenses and at a particular level, things show up in, in, a, in the way that we're looking at them. Yeah, and qualitative psychological research provides evidence that some people are very deeply affected by feelings of loss, helplessness, and frustration due to their inability to feel like they have any way to make a difference in stopping climate change. 
And something they term cognitive dissonance is rampant right now. The idea that if you face the facts, if you look at some of the bad news that we've been trying to pepper in here, we could go on for days with the bad news, so we've had to kind of balance it with some solutions. Um, the idea that if you face the facts, your current reality is really just too hard to take. You can't deal with it. And so one of the coping mechanisms is, uh, you know, to just avoid the problem altogether, to avoid those feelings. Um, but sociologists have noticed that after these natural disasters we're having, there are higher levels of suicide, substance abuse, depression, aggression, violence, interpersonal difficulties, job-related difficulties. So climate change is taking a huge toll on our mental health. And then there's another body of research on this affliction called NDD, or Nature Deficit Disorder. Uh, it's self-explanatory. It brings on many ADD symptoms and depression, especially with children, although not enough connection to nature affects all ages adversely. This is a playground, if you can believe that, that a town paid a lot of money for. And this is what it looks like. It's all concrete. There's little concrete things to play on, you know. That's the kind of, you know, that, that's the kind of thing that creates NDD. This is my daughter at one playing on the beach. And my daughter is like a beach freak now. She's 30 and she just keeps playing on the beach. And she's incredibly healthy and happy. So from the perspective of sustainability consciousness, uh, the solution really has to do with our own human development and with inspiration. Uh, and we can do that in part through architecture. And with the challenges that climate change is presenting to us, there, we really have a huge opportunity for personal growth and development for our own inner work or examining our own conversations and our own stories and our own actions. Yeah, I'm really inspired about what Chile is doing right now. It's a huge solar success story. Um, take a look at what's happened in their PV market. This is a series of, I think, only about four years. So it starts in 2013. 11 megawatts, 402 megawatts, 848 megawatts. I think we're seeing a radical shift. Yeah. I think they reached a tipping point. Yeah, so what happened? This type of growth and development shows the kind of tipping point possible when consciousness evolves broadly within a culture to refuse to accept dirty coal-fired energy. The culture itself woke up and developed. It didn't hurt that Chile is one of the best places in the world for solar energy. <laughs> Uh, we Australia's think the Pope. Australia's good too. Yeah, Australia's good too. Uh, we think the Pope's also a great example of leadership in moral development, and this is the kind of leadership that can move a culture up to new heights of understanding and action. So he says, "Let us be protectors of creation, protectors of God's plan, inscribed in nature, protectors of one another and of the environment." So he's speaking there. If you can read in that. He's speaking to a traditional audience, church-going audience, Bible readers. He's speaking to a modern audience that cares about nature. And he's speaking to a postmodern pluralist audience that cares about one another and sees us as part of the natural environment. So this kind of leadership is really powerful. But even better news is that the culture at this point in history can even override bad leadership. As we mentioned before, coal is dead, even if this man wants it to return. That's because the good news is that more and more people are aware, either because they've educated themselves or because they unfortunately have been the victim of climate change, or maybe they have enough compassion for others who are victims to feel the cost of not addressing this. So renewables are surging because of the awareness of the populace. Hopefully, the U.S. will catch up with Europe in this regard. But from the perspective of consciousness of sustainability, what design has to offer 
is the rich experiences of nature that make us more aware of it. When you're more aware of something, you want to care for it more. So after considering climate, the patterns of human activity in buildings also affect the needs for heating, cooling, and lighting, and thus for energy. So there's a strategy in Sun, Wind, and Light called energy conscious occupant behaviors. Focus uh, on conscious. Conscious, right. And that can affect energy use and many other things. In other words, how conscious the occupant is can make a difference. So this is a 19th century plantation in hot, humid Louisiana, very close to my home, called Oak Alley. Pretty apt name. It's a 19th century plantation, um, and it's an architectural scheme that allows for choice and what we might call migration. So you can see it's a square plan. It's uh, surrounded by porches on all sides. And you can imagine there's no air conditioning here. Uh, all of the uh, doors open up so you can get flow through ventilation. But you can imagine the best place in a hot, on a hot day to sit in the morning is over there on the west side where you're in the shade. And then in the afternoon, you move around to the east side, which is now cooled off, and it's in the shade. Whereas in the winter time, it's a, it's a mild winter climate, and you move around to the south side where it would be sunny and warmer. And there's also a vertical pattern where the lower massive floor, which is actually brick, it's painted so you can't see that, is very cool uh, in the afternoon. It's a great afternoon retreat. While the evenings are spent on the upper floors, which are wood, and, and cool down quicker. So imagine living in such an architecture and how one might experience the climatic rhythms of the day and the season. So through the architecture, one literally becomes more aware of nature. I also think that's one of the primary roles of architecture is to place people in the significant relationships with nature because it's the primary mode through which, because we live so much in buildings, it's the primary mode that we experience nature. Uh, this experiential relatedness uh, to nature can be seen in this building. It's called the Entrepreneurship Development Institute. It's in Ahmedabad, India, and it's done by a, a, a well-known architect there named Bimal Patel. This is one of his early projects. It's a wonderful project that uses some very basic organizational strategies. You can see courtyards there, which are wide enough to admit the warm, humid breezes. And, but they're also not fully enclosed courtyards. They're permeable, which allows the air to move, right? Um, and they have lots of open to sky and covered spaces. And so what's great about this in some ways is it's a, in a hot climate institutional contemporary building built with that air conditioning where we have a constant relationship and experience to the sky and to the breeze that's always present. And the same thing you can see here in Anand Rajay's Institute for Forest Management where they have a series of unconditioned spaces and corridors that, that are open air um, and the whole series of layers around the building. So you never have a window out at the edge of the building. You always have a kind of zone at the edge of the facade. So you get this rich experience of nature and natural forces. And essentially, the building begins to establish one with a relationship in nature. So let's earth that little dot up there. We won't be able to evacuate the whole planet. This, this is our home. However, we already have, well, maybe in 600 years we'll go to Mars, but we already have the knowledge and the resources to solve the climate crisis. The question for each of us is, are we ready to make a difference? So by doing so, you in particular as young architects and designers, you have the opportunity to do more than to reduce energy use. By attempting to reverse climate change through design, you're also contributing to peace in the Middle East. And you're generating healthful conditions for our children. And you're honoring the natural world as the source of our health and of our life. And you'll be transforming architecture from something that pollutes to a profession that promotes the highest possibility for life. This is a famous photograph called the Blue Marble. It was taken on the last Apollo mission. And it's the only photograph that we have of the entire circle of the Earth, now we have composites, but this is the only one that was actually taken from a viewpoint where you see the entire Earth as a single image. And it's, it's one of those things that 
culturally helps us to think about the planet in its entirety and its fragility. Yeah, the finite planet. So we want to speak to you now, students especially. You're our hope. You are the hope for the future of the finite planet. Your creativity, your commitment, your design thinking will be what makes the difference in the future of life. And we hope that when you're asked, uh, you know, if you are committed to designing a future that reverses global warming, that your answer will be a heartfelt yes. And we know that it's, it's tough, it's rugged actually. I have three children myself. I think it's very rugged being young in this crazy time. But we have enormous confidence in your efforts and your ded dedication and that your careers will make a great contribution. So once again, we want to just encourage you to take the perspective that this is perhaps the greatest time to be involved in the built environment today. The opportunity is amazing for anyone lucky enough to be heading into practice today. So you're going to be the generation where every building counts. We think you're going to be the generation that will solve the climate crisis by design. Thank you. Thank you for your attention.